if I speak too quietly or if I write too small, I expect some friendly help, please. Okay. So uh, today we'll talk mostly about abelian varieties. So if you recall, yesterday we had the three viewpoints on an elliptic curve as a hyperelliptic curve, as a Riemann surface, and as an abelian variety. So now I'd like to go into abelian varieties. Uh, if you recall, yesterday at the end I said that the moduli space of hyperelliptic curves is an affine variety. We somehow understand this geometry extremely well, and I don't want to spend any more time on that. The other two spaces, the moduli space of curves, which is the title of this school, and the moduli space of abelian varieties, which is not the title, but which is what I'll do today, we don't understand the geometry of so much. So this is the viewpoint C, if you recall. And this is about abelian varieties. So an elliptic curve I was viewing as, in this viewpoint, as an abelian group. And when I say an elliptic curve, this is a curve, it doesn't have any special point on it. The moment I say an abelian group, this means it suddenly has a special point called zero, right? So this means inside here, the moment I say an abelian group, I automatically have a special point zero. So what I'm really thinking of here, if you go back to Melody's lecture this morning, is the moduli space M11. Because I have automatically endowed my curve was a point by saying it's an abelian group. So if I think of moduli of elliptic curves as a, of moduli of abelian groups, this is actually the moduli space M11. And if you recall Melody's lecture in the morning, this is stable. What I was writing yesterday, M1 is not so good because this is not a stable curve. The automorphism group is infinite. The moment I put a point in, this is stable. You recall that in genus one, you need to have one marked point. That's your marked point. Okay, so this was an aside, and now I'd like to generalize this. So definition, a complex torus is a compact complex manifold such that its points form a group. And in fact, you can see that the group is automatically abelian, so I'll write abelian here. Okay. So that's the definition of a complex torus. It can have different dimensions. So let's say complex g-dimensional torus, and I know people usually denote dimension by n, but we'll stick to g. It's a complex manifold of dimension g, such that the points form a group. So in particular, an elliptic curve is a complex torus of dimension one. And the reason you think of this as being a complex torus is there is a following proposition, which again, if you've never seen, you should think about. And uh, a complex torus I'll denote by A. For any complex torus, the universal cover the universal cover is isomorphic to C to the G. Okay. And this is what we did last time for elliptic curves. I said that the universal cover of an elliptic curve is always C, so this is a direct generalization. If you know well how to prove that in a smart way, the same proof would apply here, and this would tell you that the cover of a complex torus is this. A complex torus, by definition, is then a quotient of C to the G by something, by the action of the fundamental group. And you can prove in the same way that pi 1 of a complex <coughs> torus must be isomorphic to Z to the 2G. Okay? And furthermore, that A is a quotient of C to the G by a lattice, this is the image of P1. I mean, this is a DAC transformation. This is an image, I mean, this is isomorphic to pi 1, such that 
This is isomorphic to z to the 2g, and it has full rank. Okay. I wrote exactly the thing yesterday on the blackboard, except there was no g anywhere. If you erase g, this becomes a statement about elliptic curves. This is a direct generalization. The proof for elliptic curves is purely topological. And it makes no difference whether you're working in dimension 1 or dimension g. It's the same result, absolutely. So what this tells you is that if you have a complex torus, its universal cover is always c to the g. The fundamental group of the complex torus must act here, preserving the group structure in a suitable sense, maybe some affine transformations. So it means the group must be, an as a pi 1, must be an embedded subgroup of c to the g, which means it must have this form. This is imposed by the fact that your quotient must be a complex, a complex compact manifold, so the group better span everything, otherwise you'll have an infinite direction. Okay? I don't want to prove it. If there is a tutorial, uh, that may be covered, but really you guys should all do it by yourselves. This is easy if you haven't done it before. So this is a complex torus. And if you are suitably naive, you would think this is a great generalization of the notion of an elliptic curve. Okay? So you would then try to understand moduli of complex tori up to biholomorphisms. And you can try to understand this moduli space, and you can read a beautiful book by Olivier on complex tori, which will tell you a lot about complex tori. But there is something that you're actually missing here in the picture. And let's try to understand what is the part of the picture of elliptic curves that you would like to add for this to be an even better analogy. So what did we have? For an elliptic curve, we had an elliptic curve, and there was one point, the origin of the group. Which, of course, I could have chosen any other point to be the origin of the group as well. It doesn't really matter. The elliptic curve is a group, and you can shift the origin any way you want by shifting the addition law appropriately. On a complex torus, of course, I said it's a group, so again, there is a zero, and you can still shift it any way you like. But you can start worrying that uh, somehow this is not rigid enough. You can rotate complex tori a lot. And that's true, you should worry about that. But even more so, you should worry whether these are algebraic varieties. If we're algebraic geometers, we probably want to work with algebraic varieties. And if we want to ever use any fancy techniques, and if we want to say something about MMP, maybe we want to work with algebraic varieties. Of course, what I'm given is a fake motivation. It could well be that you take moduli of some non-algebraic objects, and somehow, miraculously, the moduli space is itself algebraic. But this is not what the case here is. So what I wanted to motivate is we'll need some more data. So I'd like to now consider complex tori that are algebraic varieties. So definition, which is central for this lecture, is the following. An abelian variety <coughs> is a complex torus that is a projective variety. Remember, for my lectures, everything is over C. Okay? You can build the theory not over C, but since I'm trying to give this an as down to earth way as possible, I'm always writing C. The definition of an abelian variety makes perfect sense. Over other fields, I cannot say the word complex torus anymore. I should say an abelian group, compact abelian group. This is fine. So this is a definition. So it just says that an abelian variety is a complex torus that can be embedded somehow into a projective space. If you have embedded in a projective space, this means on the projective space you have line bundles, in particular you have a bundle called O of 1. You can pull it back. So this is equivalent to there exists an ample line bundle on A.
Yeah? You all must know the definition of ample and the usefulness of ample by now very well, right? You are doing MMP, so I don't have to worry. Okay? You better say yes. So, this means that there must exist an ample line bundle. Okay. So, the way I would like to think of this abelian variety is actually an abelian variety together with the choice of this ample line bundle. So, definition. A polarized abelian variety is a pair a L, where A is an abelian variety, and L is an ample bundle, an ample line bundle on A. This is almost a correct definition, but not really. Uh, because you see, if I choose an ample line bundle in the abelian variety, I can shift it. Right? The abelian variety is a group, it has an automorphism at the point, and I can take this line bundle and I can shift it around. So I don't really want that. So I want to write here the C1 of an ample line bundle. Okay? So an abelian variety is, I will, I will certainly not write C1 in my notation, but the C1 should always be there. So I want a complex torus together for the first churn class of an ample line bundle. Okay? I'm sure I'll start writing AL in no time, in the next line presumably, but I always mean that I should only take the churn class. The point is again that if I take this L and I translate it by a point in the abelian variety, the C1 did not change. So this is a bit less data than L and that takes care of various annoying things. I should say some more, but I don't want to say this. Uh, so if you ever want to work with abelian varieties, you should read the very precise, careful definition because I'll start glossing over things soon. So this is what a polarized abelian variety is. It's a pair AL, so that AL is an ample line bundle. So if you think about this uh, as a differential geometer, what this says is equivalently C1 of L, that's the first churn class of a line bundle. So whatever this guy is, it's uh, an element of the second homology group of A, right? As a differential jaw, I mean, this is a w one form. I mean, not a one form, it's a two form, it's a one one form. Ah, it's a one one form with respect to a Hodge decomposition on A with respect to its complex structure. So it's a one one form which has integral coefficients because it corresponds to an actual line bundle. And what should I say when I say the word positive? I should write greater than zero here, which is to say positive definite. Okay, so a polarized abelian variety is a pair consisting of a complex torus, which automatically becomes an abelian variety once I have written down the first Turing class of an ample line bundle. And in terms of differential geometry, this means a positive one one form. If you have no idea what this means, ignore this. If you have no idea what an ample line bundle is, you should learn for Paolo at least, but uh, you can think of this. Okay, this is still not what I want. I want a bit more. Definition, a polarization is called principle if the dimension of the space of sections is equal to one. So a line bundle defining a polarization is called a principle, it defines a principle polarization if there is only one section up to scaling. Uh, this is equivalent to the fact that C1 of L is unimodular as, a, as an integral form. Okay, the determinant is one, I, mean, I don't want to say this. Okay, so finally, definition, a PPAV is a principally polarized abelian variety. Is an abelian, is an abelian <coughs> variety with a principal polarization.
OK? And our goal is to study the moduli of such. OK, so this must be unreadable from the back, right? Borderline, OK. So let AG be the moduli of G dimensional P, P, A, V. <coughs> so when I say moduli, what do I mean? This means up to by holomorphisms preserving polarization. Again, the way I define it, I just write moduli, so it's a set at this moment. I have to convince you it's better than a set, which I will do, sort of, in a second. But when I say moduli, this is a set of isomorphism classes. You have no right a priori to believe it has any good structure. The fact that it does is, again, a minor miracle. Okay? So let's try to, uh, before we try to understand what this is and why this is a nice object and not just a set. Let's try to do an example to make sure we have not left where we started. So if g is equal to 1, right? So A is one-dimensional complex torus. What is a polarization on a one-dimensional complex torus? How can I choose an ample line bundle on a curve. If I give you a curve and I ask you, give me please some ample line bundle on a curve, what line bundle would you give me? The curve may be genus 1, maybe genus 2, but yeah. So it needs to be a divisor, right? So what's a divisor on a curve? It's something of co-dimension 1, also known as a bunch of points with some weights. What does the word ample mean? Well, if the weights are all positive, that should certainly do the trick. Okay? So principal polarization means there should be one section, so this means <coughs> one point. On current of genus one. Okay? And what is this one point? Well, that's the origin of the elliptic curve considered as a group, for example. Okay, the C1 of that is the class of a point, nothing particularly exciting, but at least the definition here is a correct generalization of the moduli space of elliptic curves. So we have something. Okay, so far so good. So our next goal is to try to understand something about the modular space of abelian varieties without losing the microphone. Okay. Am I audible in the back, on the tape? Can you hear me? Okay. Can the computer hear me? Okay. So, I'd like to now understand what are biholomorphisms of abelian varieties. So, what, are a what is a biholomorphism? So, suppose, <coughs> let me go there. So, any complex torus A is biholomorphic to C to the G quotient by z to the g plus tau z to the g for some g by g for some tau, which is a g by g complex matrix. How do I know that? Well, th what is a complex torus? A complex torus is a quotient of c to the g by a lattice generated by two g vectors. These vectors are linearly independent, 
let me just choose my coordinates on C to the G, which are actually not given to me in any way, right? I can choose any coordinates on C to the G I want. This does not change the complex structure. So let me change the complex coordinates on C to the G such as the first G vectors as a lattice vector, as a basis vectors, right? So by choosing complex coordinates on C to the G such that the first G generators of the lattice are bases, are the bases. And all this does is it writes the first G generators this way, and then the remaining G generators, this is a G tuple of complex G dimensional vectors, I can just write it as a G by G complex matrix. Okay. So from now on, whenever I say complex torus or abelian variety, I think it's an object of this sort. And let's denote that A sub tau to indicate that this is tau. This tau is called period matrix, usually. Okay. And now my goal is to try to understand something about biholomorphisms preserving polarization of such things. But first of all, I should know which ones are actually abelian varieties. So this is a complex torus. This is an undeniable complex torus, assuming tau is sufficiently non-degenerate, whatever this thing means. But I would like to know under what conditions it is an abelian variety. And the answer is in genus one, it's always an abelian variety, which is good. In genus higher than one, it turns out the answer is not always the case. And this is a theorem I won't be able to prove for you. The proof is not hard, but it's a bit technical. So I'll state the result, and uh, you should educate yourself about the proof if you care, but uh, you can just take this to be a definition of abelian varieties equivalent to this is perfectly fine. This is called Riemann's bilinear relations. And it says A tau is an abelian variety if and only if tau can be chosen such that tau is symmetric and the imaginary part of tau is positive definite. So I'm being somehow sloppy and careful at once. I'm trying, basically I'd like to cover this line up, right? I would like to say that this is an abelian variety if and only if the period matrix has this form. What I'm saying is that the theorem that somehow naturally comes out of the natural proofs is this. Uh, let's ignore this line nonetheless, okay? So for me, an abelian variety is an object of this sort where tau satisfies this, okay? What is this business about can be chosen? This is a business about choosing different bases. You can ask, when is A tau biholomorphic to A tau prime? This is our basic question for trying to understand the moduli space. Okay? Question? No questions. Okay. So how do we understand this? Well, as before, suppose I have A tau and it's biholomorphic to A tau prime and there is some map F going, you know, whichever way it goes. The universal cover of this is C to the G the universal cover of this is also C to the G, the map must lift either way, either direction, right? It's a biholomorphism, I don't know which way it goes, okay? But the map must lift. This map lifts to a map from the universal cover, the map from any simply connected thing to anything lifts to the map from the universal cover, to the map to the universal cover. So this must be the case. This 
must be a biholomorphism. You can check that it has to preserve. Oh, well, sorry. Uh, so this must be a biholomorphism of C to the C to the G to C to the G. So it must be a linear map. I can just as well choose a point zero here because I'm free to do that and choose the point zero here and require the F twiddle to move zero to zero, which gets rid of translations which have no meaning. So this means this is a linear map of C to the G to C to the G. So this tells me immediately, similarly to how we computed that, then this is obtained from SL2Z, that the way F acts is also somehow fractional linear in a suitable sense. Okay? And then when you do this, this is all about complex tori. Now you would like something about the polarizations. And if you interpret the polarization in these terms as an element of H11, you see that what this says is that a suitable element of H11 should go to a suitable element of H11. And here I'm sweeping something under the rug. So what I'm sweeping under the rug is somehow that I, if I tell you tau, you know how to define a principal polarization in a natural way on this A sub tau. So remark, there exists a natural principal polarization usually denoted theta tau on A sub tau for any tau satisfying this. So let's call this Hg and for any tau in Hg there exists such a thing. Uh, Hg is called the Ziegel upper half space and H1 is the upper half plane, right? H1 is numbers, so they're always symmetric with positive imaginary part, okay? So for any tau in here, there is a way to naturally define a polarization, which I'll sweep under the rug for now. It will appear maybe in later lectures, but for now, let's not worry about it. And then somehow you can look how such F acts on polarization, and the result is the following theorem. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Let me not answer this question. <laughs> so what I, every abelian variety is isogenous to a principle of polarized abelian variety. That's all I said, actually. So I have not said anything uh, else. So what I said is that given any tau, I have this complex torus A sub tau. Given such a tau, there is a natural principle polarization on this complex torus. If you have an abelian variety, you can write it in this form, not uniquely. So there would be different principal polarizations on this abelian variety. Uh, let me write the next line, and uh, then I'll write one more line. And then I'll say, if you didn't like anything I did before, you can take the next as a definition. Okay? So um, you are right that somehow this looks like I somehow implicitly have chosen the principal polarization here. That's not the case. If I try to do some other fixed type of polarization, the Ziegel space will still be the Ziegel space. The next line would be wrong, would be, wrong, would be different. Okay, I'm happy to answer this in more detail, but not now. Okay, so the theorem is uh, A tau is biholomorphic to A sub tau as a bi is isomorphic as principally polarized abelian varieties, meaning so that you preserve polarization, if and only if there exists an element gamma in, if you are thinking about uh, elliptic curves, I'm supposed to say if there exists a gamma in SL2Z. So I'll write almost this, but I'll write SP to GZ such that tau is equal to a tau plus b, c tau plus d inverse. So we should relate gamma to the a, b, c, d. Yes, uh, this uh, goes here. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I should tell you what, what this means. I wrote gamma where SP 
2GZ is a space of matrices A, B, C, D such that A, B, C, D are G by G integral matrices This whole thing is called gamma, and gamma 0, 1, minus 1, 0, gamma transpose is 0, 1, minus 1, 0. Where these are g by g blocks. Okay, so the symplectic group is a group of matrices that preserve a symplectic form. If I write a symplectic form in this block form, then this is the condition to preserve a symplectic form. And integral means entry integral, yes. Thank you. It doesn't matter which side I put the prime on, it just changes gamma to gamma inverse. Okay? If you go to genus 1, SL2Z is precisely this. This as determinant is plus minus 1, let's not worry about plus minus. And that's exactly the condition. Uh, I have to say, I don't know whether I wrote it correctly. Maybe it should be not a tau, but tau a. Maybe I should multiply by the inverse on the left, not on the right. I can never remember. Nobody can ever remember. I promise if you write a paper, it should come out okay. okay? <laughs> but you should check. Uh, it depends on whether I'm writing tau here on the left or on the right. And the way it looks to me, I have written it wrongly. Because if tau is on the left here, it should be on the left in here also but we we'll won't worry about that. In genus 1, it doesn't matter, everything commutes. In higher genus, each of these guys is a G by G matrix. It does make a difference in which order I multiply them, so I probably wrote it wrongly, but conceptually it's correct. Okay? Questions? Okay. So thus, the moduli space of abelian varieties is a quotient of the Ziegel upper half space by the symplectic group under this section. That's what the theorem says. The theorem says that two principally polarized abelian varieties are isomorphic if and only if they are mapped one to the other, the period matrices are mapped one to the other by the symplectic group action. Again, I have somehow written this quotient on the left because I'm more used to writing it on the left. It should somehow match the left-right multiplications I have done in other places. There is a reason, however, why you write it this way is remark. There is an approach we are not going to pursue here so much, but I should mention that the Ziegel upper half space is not something miraculous and something very strange. We're talking about the local asymmetric domain. So what this really is, is a symplectic group with real coefficients quotient by the maximal compact, which is the SUGC. Oh, uh, yeah, just U. Sorry, no S. Okay. And if you write it this way, and you're used to local asymmetric space, it says G mod K mod gamma. G mod K mod gamma, so I should write this on the left. If you don't know what I just said, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to pursue this. Okay? So this is the moduli space of abelian varieties. And if you didn't like anything we did before, you can take this as a definition. Right? This is an explicitly defined space. It's a space of symmetric G by G matrices with positive definite imaginary part, complex, I should have written this, but hopefully it was clear here. And there is a symplectic group action defined this way. And you can take the quotient, and that's what you have. Okay? And then you would believe that with some luck, this nice discrete group acts reasonably nicely on this space, so that the quotient would have a structure of a complex, well, you would love to say manifold, but as we learn in genus 1, we should be saying orbifold anyway. So theorem. A G is a complex orbifold. Okay. 
This you can check by hand from the definition, more or less. You need to check that all the stabilizers are finite and that the group action is suitably, well, not quite co-compact, but discrete. If you are an expert on local asymmetric spaces, you would say sure. Okay? So that's our guy. This is the moduli space of principally polarized abelian varieties. Let's try to understand something about it. Well, the first thing to understand is maybe the dimension. So what is the dimension of the moduli space of abelian varieties? That's an orbifold. The word dimension makes sense. Ignore the orbit part. It's only about some bad loss. It's just basically a manifold with some stabilizers. The dimension is the dimension of a manifold. Well, let's look at this. This is a quotient by this, of this space by this. This is countable. Huge, really, but countable. So the dimension is equal to the dimension of this guy. What's the dimension of this guy? Well, this are G by G symmetric complex matrices with positive definite imaginary part. Positive definite imaginary part is an inequality. You can see it's an inequality. It's actually a collection of inequalities. But in any case, it's a bunch of inequalities. So these are open conditions. Okay? So if you have a matrix with a positive definite imaginary part, the nearby matrix will also have a positive definite imaginary part. So these conditions don't change your dimension. This is what gives you the dimension. So the dimension is the same as the dimension <coughs> of HG. That's what uh, I said before. And this is equal to G times G plus 1 over 2. Okay. And then we can ask the usual questions that I tried to ask last time for hyperelliptic curves and moduli of curves. What is the birational geometry of AG? And how to compactify? Okay. And instead of addressing this now, what I'd like to do now is to say this is a theory of abelian varieties, and now I'd like to relate it somehow to the theory of curves. Okay. Any questions? For how many of you this is the first time you've seen an abelian variety defined in your life? Raise your hands. Oh, so everybody has seen the definition of an abelian variety before. How many of you n have known this before? knew this prior. Okay, good. So this means the rest of you have learned something new or, or are too asleep to answer. Okay, so this is a story about abelian varieties. Now I'd like to relate this to curves. Oh, and by the way, as an answer to the question about polarizations and what happens if I have a non-principal polarization, this should not be the symplectic group. It should be a group that preserves a non-principal polarization, which means instead of one here, I write a suitable diagonal matrix. And then the whole story goes through, but it, what I'll do next gets very complicated, so we don't want to go there. Okay? Okay. So, questions? No questions. How many of you know what the Jacobian of a Riemann surface is? How many of you know how to define it analytically, integrals of stuff? How many of you know how to define it algebraically, Picard or something? Okay. So I'll do both of this rather quickly, and then we'll proceed. And then we'll run out of time, of course. So Jacobians of curves of Riemann surfaces, if you wish. So C is a curve, smooth curve for me, of genus G. Okay. Peak D of C is what it is? Many of you said you knew the defi algebraic definition of the Jacobian. <laughs> so somebody who does not have a PhD must know the answer. 
Hmm? Line bundles of degree D, that's promising. <coughs> On C of degree D. Yes, and then I have to quotient by something. By what? Linear equivalence. Correct? What does linear equivalence mean? Hmm? Two line bundles are called linearly equivalent, or as a line bundle is linearly equivalent to zero, or as a divisor, which is a collection of points in the Riemann surface, is linearly equivalent to zero, if it's a divisor of a function, of a meromorphic function, if it's a set of zeros and poles of a meromorphic function. Okay. I want uh, to now use this to define a Jacobian. Uh, the, the idea is that I want the Jacobian of C to be an abelian variety. So I would write Jacobian of C by definition is P naught of C. Okay? You probably start objecting and you should be objecting. If I, a, if I write it this way, certainly there is a zero here and there is a point here, which is OC, right? And this has group structure. Yes? Because I can tensor two line bundles. This is an abelian group structure. So this thing here is certainly an abelian group with a chosen zero. Somehow, on the other hand, those of you who have seen this definition may have seen Jacobian of C is peak G minus 1 of C. Okay? What's the difference? Well, the difference is inside here, I have the locus of effective divisors of degree G minus 1 on C. This locus, if I take C times itself, G minus 1 times, this maps onto here, right? A divisor is effective if it's a collection of points with positive weights, it's degree G minus 1, so it's just a sum of G minus 1 points, possibly with some repetitions. So the locus of effective divisor of degree G minus 1, this has dimension G minus 1 and claim it gives a principal polarization. On peak G minus 1 of C. Okay? So somehow it seems that my attempt to define the Jacobian has fallen apart. Because I was supposed to construct for you a principally polarized abelian variety. So I was supposed to give you a complex torus, a abelian group, with a zero, with a group structure, and with a principal polarization. And sadly enough, I have not succeeded. Because if I think of peak naught, I get a group structure, nice zero. I don't get a principal polarization. If I think of peak G minus one, I get a naturally defined principal polarization, an actual divisor, which I can take the C1 of, I don't get a group structure. So the question is what to do. Okay? And uh, the way you resolve this problem, if you are in a basic Riemann surface class, or well for us, for now, is the following. You say, well, peak G minus 1 of C is isomorphic to peak naught of C by taking a line bundle uh, of degree D, so fix D and pick G minus 1, and take L to L tensor D inverse. Right? Just choose one divisor, doesn't matter which one. Then, if you tensor with this divisor, with this line bundle, you have decreased the degree by G minus 1, and certainly this is an isomorphism, you can go back, you can tensor with the divisor. So certainly these two things are isomorphic. The isomorphism is not natural. 
Because I have to choose D and there is no reasonable way to choose D. It's doable. If I do this, then I'll identify both things and I'll think of the group structure as coming from here. I'll think of the effective device as coming from here and I'll be happy. This is not very nice because I had to choose D. Another way to try to remedy this is to define a group structure on peak G minus 1 directly. So if I tend the two line bundles, alternatively, can try to define, and I can define, group structure, uh, can try, no. on peak G minus 1 by L, no, plus L prime is L tensor L prime, which is in degree 2G minus 2, and then I can tensor with the inverse of the canonical bundle. This does not work. I mean, this is unfortunately in peak nod. So, oops. So if I wanted to do it, I would need to tensor by a square root of the canonical. Then I need to choose a square root of the canonical. And I'll need to suffer anyway. So the correct approach So the correct definition in a Riemann surfaces course, the Jacobian is this, full stop. The correct definition, and this is how we were taught to look at this by Valery Alexeyev, and I'd like to mention this because I'll be compactifying AG and it's useful to keep this picture in mind, is the following. The Jacobian of C is really the pair, peak naught of C and peak G minus one of C, and this is a group and this has principal polarization and peak nod of C acts on peak G minus 1 of C transitively. Okay. So it seems I have completely misled you because I promised to define a Jacobian, and I hoped that the Jacobian would be a principally polarized abelian variety, and instead I have written this extra complicated object. The Jacobian is a pair consisting of a group acting on a space. The space has a natural polarization. The group has a natural group structure. So this is somehow the correct picture. So I should say this is a torso. I should have defined the moduli of abelian varieties as moduli of such objects. Okay. Let's take a deep breath and let's forget this and let's do the analytic definition for a second. Okay? Keep this in mind. So the correct definition, which I don't want to go through because this will be extremely hard, is that an abelian, a principally polarized abelian variety should really be such a pair the w in, in this viewpoint, which is a group, uh, which is a, tor a torso and an abelian variety, really, with a polarization naturally defined on a torso. Okay. You don't like this? Forget this. Let me define the Jacobian analytically and proceed. Okay. So this was uh, one definition of the Jacobian, which is to say it should be peak G minus 1, but then I had this elaborate roundabout step to explain what really happens. Okay. Complex analytic definition. So recall that if I take homology of a genus G Riemann surface, this is Z to the 2G. Okay. 
that should ring a bell, right? Uh, z to the 2g is also what we're taking the quotient of c to the g to define a complex torus. And there is a pairing, there is a an intersection product here. Okay? Let then A1 AG B1 BG be a basis uh, set of generators, I should say, of homology such that AI and AJ do not intersect, BI and BJ do not intersect, and AI intersect BJ is equal to delta, the chronica delta IJ. So I'm choosing a basis a symplectic basis for homology. This is actually a symplectic space. The intersection product makes it into a symplectic space that starts to feel better and better for our attempts to do abelian varieties. And I'm choosing this basis, okay? Uh, so this is the intersection of two lines, of two paths, if you want. If you perturb them, you count them as, as multiplicity. Let me draw a picture. So a picture, maybe I should draw in genus two because otherwise my drawing skills will be stressed. So, I'm supposed to draw for you on the genus 2 Riemann surface four elements of H1. How do I draw elements of H1? Well, I don't know how to draw them, but I know how to draw elements of pi 1. And this, of course, maps onto here. Okay? So I'll draw four paths, and I'll say take the homology class of this path. And nothing is simpler than drawing this four paths. Even with my drawing skills, I can just draw this. Okay, and I'll call this A1, B1, A2, B2. Okay? Notice that I cannot relabel A2 and B2 the other way around. They intersect at one point, and somehow whatever my orientation on the surface is should be such that this is plus. So if I switch them around, it should be a minus. So of these two paths, I do know that this one is A2, this one is B2. Of course, I can choose a completely different basis but choose some basis, okay? Also recall that if I now take sections of the canonical bundle on C, uh, this is the same as uh, holomorphic one forms on C, this is C to the G, okay? So given A1 up to BG, there exists a unique basis omega 1, omega G of this space such that the integral of omega I over AJ is equal to delta IJ. Okay? Why is this the case? This is the non-negativity of the pairing between homology and homology, and I'm choosing H10, so the complement is H01, so you can do this. Okay, so you basically take any basis, you compute its integrals over the cycles A, and then you orthonormalize omegas. Okay? So this is a exercise for you, if you haven't done this. Okay? Definition, the period matrix of C with given A1 through BG is the matrix tau such that tau IJ is equal to the integral of this omega I over BJ. And if you look at this formula, you should ask me, how do I remember that I goes here and J goes here, not the other way around? And the answer is, doesn't matter. So theorem, tau, let's, let's call this tau of C. 
lies in the Ziegel upper half space. Which is to say this matrix is positive definite, has positive definite imaginary part and is symmetric. Okay? And then I can define the Jacobian of C is the abelian variety with this period matrix. Okay. This is theorem. Riemann's bilinear relations is a theorem name that uh, applies to this theorem as well as to the theorem I said before. Riemann really proved this, but he wrote some very convincing remarks, so the other theorem should also be attributed to him to some extent. Okay? So this is the definition of the Jacobian very explicitly. I have taken a Riemann surface, taken a basis of cycles, taken a dual basis of one forms, integrated stuff, got a Riemann surface, uh, got a Jacobian and a Bilan variety. You notice that, of course, this tau depends on the choice of A and B. So if I go to a different choice of A and B, you can see how this tau will change. This is a basis of a symplectic space. So if I go to a different basis, the change of basis will be a symplectic. And, this, and then you can track through that, and that will be exactly the action of the symplectic group that used to be on the blackboard but was erased since. So it all matches up. So this is well defined. So what I just mumbled says the following remark. This defines a map. Morphism, if you wish, a map, who cares? Oops, sorry, MG to AG, which takes a curve to its Jacobian. Okay? So thi this is to say this procedure is well defined, that the isomorphism class of the principally polarized abelian variety does not depend on the choices of A and B that I have made. Okay? Now, here is a serious theorem. This was not so hard. If you know your Riemann surfaces, you'll prove this easily. This is much harder. And this is the so-called Torelli theorem. Let's call this map J for Jacobian. Some people call it T for Torelli. And the theorem is J is an embedding of sets, is injective. As a map of sets. This I can't even indicate even the ideas of a proof to you at this point because this requires knowing something about Jacobians. For example, if you know well what the principal polarization on the Jacobian looks like, you should be able to extract what the curve was from knowing this principal polarization. Knowing this principal polarization comes under the name of Riemann theta singularity theorem and all this package, and I have not said the word theta until now, so I won't be able to prove this. There are many, many proofs of this. There is a proof using derived categories, also very nice. I won't tell you that either because this also goes beyond the scope of what we want to do. Let me uh, make a more refined comment for your benefit so that you are careful when you are using this. Uh, I might come back to this in the last lecture, it would be useful. As a map of stacks, or rather orbifolds, I should say here, since we don't say the word stacks in this course, as a map of four orbifolds, J is 2 to 1 branched along the hyperelliptic locus. And uh, the reason is for any principally polarized abelian variety, A tau has an automorphism. which takes a point z and sends it to minus z. A generic curve of genus greater than 2 has no automorphisms. So what this means is that if I really think very carefully about AG 
every point is a orbifold point. At every point there is a Z mod 2 stabilizer. So somehow every point I should count as not really a point but one half of a point. Well a generic point of MG is really a point. And then if I move map of points to one half of a point, this is a two to one map. And the involution minus one only exists for hyperelliptic Jacobians, so that's where it branches. Okay? You can table this in the back of your mind. Most people just write this. I'll tell you the correct version because uh, I'll try to use this to quickly tell you how to compute the canonical class of MG later on. Okay. Uh, one last remark. So if you believe this, you will see that this thing here, this is six dimensional, so dimension is equal to six. This is dense, open dense, in A3, with the dimension of which is also equal to six. The Jacobians of genus four curves, the dimension is nine, if I, if I take the closure, I don't get all of A4 because the dimension here is 10. Okay? So recall that at the end of the last talk, I told you, which you probably knew already, that every genus 2 curve is hyperelliptic, not every genus 3 curve is hyperelliptic. So the hyperelliptic locus in genus 3 is a proper subset of M3. This tells you that the locus of Jacobians in genus 4 is a proper subset of A4. So there are really three different spaces, hyperelliptic curves, curves, and principally polarized abelian varieties, and they should be studied separately. Okay? Okay. One question before we stop. How many of you know how to compute that the dimension of mg is 3g minus 3? How many of you would be able to prove this, given half an hour? <laughs> okay. So this is for me to plan the next lecture. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say for today. So let me summarize. We have a moduli space of principally polarized abelian varieties, which I have defined for you more abstractly and more concretely as the quotient of the Ziegel upper half space by SP. And we have a map from the moduli space of curves to the moduli space of abelian varieties, which is injective. Okay? And our goal now is to study moduli of curves and moduli of abelian varieties and some interplay between those. And what we'll do next time is we'll compactify. So luckily, Melody is compactifying MG for you, and Eduardo did this last week. Uh, Melody will continue, I'm sure, and I will say some more words. But I'll like to also tell you something about compactifying AG. And then once we do that, we have spaces which we'd like to understand, and we'd like to understand divisors of them. So our next goal would be to try to understand divisors on MG and AG. Okay, or at least something about them. Okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>